If you are like me and are a huge comic book fan, I'm sure superheroes are probably on your top five list of fantasy, sci-fi, and anything that's more than natural in terms of content and media. As I think I have grown in my search of both myself and the kind of media that I want to consume, I find myself getting more and more drawn into the glamour and social commentary of The Boys. For those of you who don't know what The Boys is, it is a superhero adult series on Amazon Prime that discusses how superheroes are, at the end of the day, still human and whether or not we should be welcoming and treating them like gods or like the people that they truly are. I think that this is a really thought-provoking storyline to start with. And it's a common satirical critique of the superhero genre because it asks the question, who watches The Watchmen? But I think what the boys is able to do differently is that they are able to not only show how superheroes can be bad, but also how humans are not as good as we think we are without the superpowers. And so when I saw that they were dropping a spinoff called Gen V, I knew I had to watch this series. Hello and welcome back to my channel. I saw that there are some new subscribers, so I did want to say hello, welcome to the channel. If you aren't new here, hi, welcome back. I am so excited to get into this new video because I feel like there's a lot that we need to unpack about Gen V. And not just Gen V, but adult superhero content in general. And kind of compare that to the current financial and I think audience receiving level of respect that Marvel is struggling with right now and kind of maybe why that is. Spoiler alert, it's the fact that it's adult content. We want we want adult stories, I'm not just talking about Echo, okay? I'm ready to see that, but at the same time, I've been scorned. You know what they say, fool me once, strike one, but fool me twice, strike three. <laughs> Before we get into this video, which I'm so excited to share with you all, please make sure to hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, and while you're at it, go ahead and hit that notification bell so you never miss a video here on Critical Commentary. I really wanted to compare the difference of adult storytelling, especially in the superhero world, and I also wanted to talk about some of the political messages that are very apparent in both of these productions philosophies. I wanted to try and see if I can convince those who are patiently waiting for season four of The Boys to give this show a try. I saw on social media and I've even had conversations with people in the real world who haven't seen this show. And I feel like if you haven't seen the show, you have to because it's already been known by the production team and Eric Kripke, who is the showrunner of The Boys and Gen V, that Gen V will very directly tie into season four. I mean, I don't know how anybody didn't think that that wasn't going to be a part of the boys just because I feel like we saw Marie Moreau or Jazz Sinclair the actor's face in season three and I thought that was kind of obvious but apparently it's not because of that though I won't really be getting into too much spoilers this will be a why you should be watching it style video so get ready our story begins with Marie Moreau who is our protagonist and badass bloodbender of the show Marie Moreau is played by Jazz Sinclair, who, like I said before, appeared in a picture cameo in season three when Huey visits the Red River Institute. She is the person that we follow and learn all about this world at God U. The pilot episode starts off with a young Marie who starts her cycle for the very first time. This is when her compound V powers activate and she realizes that she is a bloodbender. In the process of realizing all of this, she accidentally unalives her family in front of her little sister. They are separated and Marie ends up growing up at the Red River Institute, which is why you see her picture in The Boys Season 3. Marie is 
desperate and very driven. She needs to get into Godolkin University, which is nicknamed God You. When she's talking with her counselor, her counselor is reminding her that she can't get away with some of the things that the other students can because of her background and because of her power set. And she is very determined to become the first black woman of the seven. So, you know, no pressure. Once she gets into Godolkin University, she ends up becoming friends with some of the popular upperclassmen. They all go out and start getting to know each other when a very disastrous and PR significant incident occurs off campus. And this kind of ends up throwing Marie in a whole spiral of not only on-campus conspiracies, but conspiracies that might involve Vi. When I first started watching this episode, I was immediately engaged. I found myself really trying to figure out the characters. I loved looking at the different power sets and comparing their power sets to comic book characters that I'm already familiar with. For example, you know, they call Luke, who is Golden Boy, you know, he lights up he's pretty much the human torch from fantastic four kate is very similar to in my opinion i thought more phoenix but a lot of people were comparing her to emma frost and i can see where that like mindset would go especially with how she looks and how she dresses it's britney bitch and then andre is pretty much just magneto but i found you know the most interesting power sets to be between Jordan's power sets and Marie's. Like I said before, Marie is a bloodbender or has hemokinesis and is able to control the blood of not only hers but other people. And at this point in time where we meet her when she's a freshman at Godolkin University, we see that the, her ways of activating her powers are very much correlated to self-harm techniques. And this becomes a not significant part of her arc. I kind of wish it was a little bit more interesting or more do like dove into because I do think that it does have some sort of significance. But at the same time, season four has been renewed. We know that there's going to be direct correlation between the boys and Gen V. So maybe she'll pop up in season four and we'll get a little bit more, you know, deep dives into that. But with Jordan, I really found Jordan's power sets to be interesting because they are gender shifting. So they are able to maintain two different forms. So they're both one and two. Jordan has been growing up mostly in their male form, but is now starting to become more comfortable, especially as they are a TA for the Dean in their female form. And you notice that they'll start to shift between their forms kind of interchangeably depending on the situation. And that is something that Marie does bring up. Again, it's the clink and you'll miss it kind of moment, but it is brought up as to why they choose to take a form at a certain time. And again, I would like to see this flushed out a little bit more. While I did not like her power set, um, Marie's roommate and kind of like fledgling BFF, <laughs> Emma, who's also known as Little Cricket, has very similar power sets to Ant-Man and the Wasp. She can grow and also shrink. Most of the time she does shrinking and her power sets are also very similar to Marie's and that her activation technique revolves around self-harm and in her instance it's more ED related. These are storylines that I always find really interesting. I think it's interesting to explore why certain people have certain power sets. I think it does help flush out their character a little bit more. And I honestly used to find this to be a really good question to ask people when I was getting to know them because I always found that people picked power sets that either they felt like they were lacking or felt like there was something that was driving them towards that. And so I did find, you know, their exploration of, you know, how their powers kind of feed into their psyche as a very interesting thing. And so that's why I really liked Jordan because I felt like Jordan's power sets reminded me a lot of Legion and Crazy Jane from the DCU universe. Um, she's very uh, notably known right now on Doom Patrol. In those instances, having multiple personalities or multiple forms with different powers is always tied to severe mental illness or SMI. And 
I love those kinds of power sets. I think it's cool when you're able to shift between different power sets like that. I think it makes you, I mean, there's a reason why Legion is a mega level plus mutant. He is able to do so much with these different personalities, but at the same time, it's always tied to him having mental illness issues. And so the fact that this is able to be more about like unifying your identity and being more comfortable in yourself I just found that to be a really interesting way of shifting and subverting that trope and I just also felt like it was more respectful to those types of characters because I think that when we like limit a character to mental illness it just gets we get into the Wanda factor we get into the Moon Knight factor and I I just I think that that's a little bit outdated what makes Gen V such a good show is that one it not only expands upon the boys' lore but it also gives us new characters to root for and invest in and it also gives us a little bit of that commentary that satire that I was talking about this show is both funny and really serious and talks about really serious topics I already said that the power sets are allegories to self-harm and EDs and dealing with your identity but the world that they are set in in the boys it's so it's so mirrored to our current reality in a way that I think Marvel isn't really doing the boys is successful because it leans into some of the depravity and some of the just human aspects of being alive and it also deals with betrayal corruption and having this superiority complex over other people and how you need to deal with that do you use your powers for good or for evil do you honor these powers as a sign of god or do you see it for the chemically engineered cash cow that it is and speaking of cash cow let's get into marvel i was doing a little bit of digging into the viewership of the disney plus streaming service and was not really able to find a lot of updated data honestly the earliest or the latest i could find was the Nielsen ratings for streaming for Disney Plus, and that was in June of this year. So this is pretty old data. And I know that Nielsen is very slow at r reporting their numbers, but the fact that this is the only thing I've been able to find is a little bit disconcerting. You can tell me, what the hell are you hiding? So I'm looking at my data here, and it's saying that WandaVision made about 1.6 million views, Loki season one at 2.5, so this is not including the most recent season that came out, which was, it was I. She-Hulk was at 1.5 million, which I will say, even though a lot of people did not like that show, I loved that show. Um, She-Hulk is one of my faves. I think she's amazing. I love the duality of her character. And I also just, yeah, like, I mean, the fact that it's in the middle to bottom, I'm like, I get it. But I also really loved that show. Um, and then Miss Marvel, which was one of the most recent things that came out between that and I think Moon Knight was less than a million. So you're seeing a gradual incline. And the fact that WandaVision it didn't beat Loki, I think a lot of that has something to do with the fact that it was the first Disney Plus show out of the gate. I think people didn't really know what to expect. And I think people ended up really loving WandaVision later on. But I do think now that Multiverse of Madness has come out and Sam Raimi didn't watch Multiverse of Madness. Bombastic side eye. There was some disconnect. I've seen so far almost all of the Disney Plus Marvel shows. And I do see that there is this gradual decline in storyline quality. And I do think that part of that is, you know, because of the cross competition. You know, we've got Amazon Prime with the boys and DC with their reboot. But let's be honest, DC is not really doing anything right now outside of their animated studios. And so as far as their, you know, content is, they, they're not really doing much competing. And so to see that Marvel has almost a clear pathway to 
gaining and maintaining the viewership that they had after Endgame, it's very weird and surprising to see that they are losing a lot of that grip. I think that grip has something to do with the fact that they are unwilling to tell stories that really include the adult lens. Now, I know that that's not the only problem, and I will get into the other part of the problem, but I do think that when you're looking at comic books and you're looking at how they're being consumed, we're already seeing a bit of a decline in sales for comics. I know that I have some physical, like, single edition comics, but to be honest, outside of, like, full graphic novels, I don't keep physical media anymore. Movies and TV shows, that's going to be the way to kind of really increase that engagement, tackle adult topics, adult questions. It's not always about good versus evil. It's more about the whys behind the evil or the whys behind the good that start to really bring in an adult audience. And that is something that I think is severely lacking with Marvel. Now, I know that once this video comes out, you know, this will hopefully be out before Echo. And I know that Echo had a red band trailer. It looks like it's going to have more gore, more blood, something that Disney in the past has really been against. But it also seems that they're going to be tackling disability um, living with hearing impairment and also dealing with toxic family members and those are definitely more I think adult storylines I think that these are things that adults really want to learn about and want to see when they engage in this kind of escapism media like superhero stories but because Kevin Feige and Marvel are tied to the Disney brand, I think that that really limits them and what kind of storylines that they can do. I mean, there's a reason why there was so many jokes about how, you know, the first few phases of Marvel were virtually, you know, sexless and there wasn't a lot of romance going on. I think the main romance that we saw was between Wanda and Vision. And that was, you know, kind of later. It worked at that time. But now I think people are, are looking for more stories. And it seems like they're trying to do things with like the Wiccan series. But at the same time, there is this sense of sanitization with Marvel due to being attached to Disney. And I think that that hindrance is really affecting them when you look at these numbers and you look at these box offices. I wanted to go through some of the older movies that are newer movies that came out and kind of get into the... RT scores because I found the RT scores to be very interesting. Season one of Gen V got a Rotten Tomato score of 97% with an audience score of 76, which is really good. The Marvels, which has just recently um, been released, and I know that there's a lot of drama with that, was at 61 tomato score with an 83 audience score. I have not seen the Marvels yet. I do want to go see it. I don't know if I want to go see it in theaters because of how scorned I've been in some of the previous movies. Like I said, I saw... Um, Multiverse of Madness in theaters. I saw Thor Love and Thunder in theaters. And I feel like a lot of the movies that I've seen in theaters, I ended up regretting buying my ticket because I was like, I could have just waited for it to go on Disney Plus for no extra cost. And, you know, when you look at how the Marvels, like I said, got a 61%, Eternals got a 47%, and Ant-Man and the Wasp was a 46 Thor Love and Thunder at 63 Like, these are not good these are not good numbers, especially when you compare to the phases before. We were seeing a huge uptick in people really feeling like this is appointment television. You need to see this the weekend it comes out or immediately when it comes out in theaters. And I think this hesitation is coming from a sense of them losing a sense of what their identity really is as a production company and what they're really doing to the comic book fandom who is consuming their media like I said before and I you know I definitely want to make sure that I get into it in this video is the variety article I'm not sure if you know about this and if you don't honestly having the having the bliss of not knowing that this article exists is is, is amazing <laughs> When this article came out, there was a lot of drama. I mean, I'm sure anyone on Twitter saw the beef going on between Marvel Studios and Nia DaCosta because they were calling out the Marvels. There was some stuff going on with the Jonathan Majors case. And there was also the issue with Disney Plus and the inundating of just new streaming series that were technically a part of the MCEU and local part of the lore, but not actually 
rewarding that kind of dedication with a good story. I think that mixed messaging, them trying to appease both liberal and conservative audiences, has put them in a place where they are not really able to achieve the same level of, I think, commentary that The Boys is able to do. And somehow, even though The Boys is very, very heavy-handed in their ways of critiquing not just our political system, our society, the way that we look at gender, I think that they are attacking these ways in a very liberal way that for some reason still will attract conservative audiences. I mean, come on, look at the fact that everyone is obsessed with Homelander. Because Disney and Marvel don't really want to take accountability, it feels like when they are discussing, you know, what they want to do with this next new phase, it definitely feels more like it's damage control than it is, you know, carving out a really structured and organized path forward. But, like, does that mean I'm not going to show up for Echo when it drops in January? A hundred percent yes. Like, at the same time, just because I am critiquing Marvel's ability to really appeal to adult audiences, the minute I saw that Echo trailer, I know I've been hurt, but, like, let's try one more time. See, when you do clownery, the clown comes back to bite. But still, I'm going to do it because... I'm curious to see what this risk will do. You know, I think that it's interesting to see Echo be the first more mature series that we're going to see because I know Deadpool 3 is already going to be slated to be rated R. So I want to see Disney really dip their toe in more adult storytelling. I would like to see Marvel do well. I was really enjoying the previous phases of their connected universe and I think that there is enough room on this world for more than one version of superhero content. But I do think that the reason why Gen V is just doing so well is because it's not afraid to go there and neither are the boys. They aren't afraid to take risks and because they are not tied to a family friendly company, they are afforded that privilege of doing so. So I, you know, at the end of the day, I really loved Gen V and I thought that Gen V was amazing. I probably going to go watch it again because I literally cannot wait for season four of The Boys and I just need to be back in that world and I need to be back with these characters. And I'm, you know, I'm curious to know what you think. Do you agree with me? Do you disagree? Also, I'm really curious to know if you could what would be the superpower that you have? Please let me know in the comments below as well as your opinions on Gen V if you've seen the show. If you have seen the show, please mark spoilers for anyone that might be reading through the comments. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Also, make sure to follow me on Twitter and Instagram at criticalcom with two Ns TV. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. Bye, everybody.